to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. And as soon as Jeroboam the son of Nebat heard of it, for he was still in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon, then Jeroboam returned from Egypt. And they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and said to Rehoboam, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. He said to them, Go away for three days, then come again to me. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who stood before Solomon his father while he was yet alive, saying, How do you advise me to answer this people? And they said to him, If you will be a servant to this people today and serve them, and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. But he abandoned the counsel that the old men gave him, and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. And he said to them, What do you advise that we answer this people who have said to me, Lighten the yoke that your father put on us? And the young men who had grown up with him said to him, Thus shall you speak to this people who said to you, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you lighten it for us. Thus shall you say to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. And now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king said, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people harshly, and forsaking the counsel that the old men had given him, he spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord spoke by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. And when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, Look now to your own house, David. So Israel went to their tents. But Rehoboam reigned over the people of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was taskmaster over the forced labor. And all Israel stoned him to death with stones. And King Rehoboam hurried to mount his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. And when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. Dear Father, we are grateful, we are so grateful that you, you speak to us, you give us light and truth and knowledge and revelation, and would you please do that for us, so that your, your written word would come into our hearts to change us. Amen. Australia, we are the biggest island nation in the world and by a long way to a whole continent united as one country. That's, that makes us unique, doesn't it? That's, it's a cause for national pride. But did you know that it almost fell apart? In 1933, they held a referendum in Western Australia to leave the Commonwealth to split Australia into two and make WA its own country. 
they even had a name for this new country, Westralia. And it had its own flag and everything. Can you imagine if that was successful? How different would things be today? We have two separate delegations to the United Nations, two separate defence forces. We'd have an Australian embassy in Perth, two Olympic teams. You want to go to Perth, you need a passport. And who knows, maybe the two countries wouldn't get on. Maybe there'd be a civil war or something like that. Australia would look very different. But you know the funny thing? That referendum actually passed. Western Australia voted to leave the Commonwealth. 66%, that's a big, mar big margin too. The only reason it didn't happen is because the British said, that's not legal, it has to be the whole country that decides something like that. But think, if it had have happened, what would, what would we think? I guess we'd think of it as a tragedy. Australia divided our one beautiful united country, torn in two. It'd be like a divorce. We'd be horrified. But if that would be a tragedy, then what we read about in Scripture today would be even worse. Here we see the nation of Israel divided. Ten tribes up in the north, they often form their own country, and, and one tribe down south, Judah. The kingdom split in two. But it's more than that, because Israel isn't just any kingdom. Israel is also God's kingdom. It was led by God's king. It was governed by God's laws. It was blessed with a special relationship with God. It had God's temple, God's priests, God's prophets. Now, God's kingdom is divided. And as we look at these sad turn of events, we're going to see the failure of two kings. But these two kings are going to point us to a greater king. So firstly, we see the failure of Solomon. Now, we met Solomon last week, didn't we? But, and we saw that Solomon was king over Israel's golden age. The people of Israel multiplied. They prospered. And the nation was powerful and influential, a regional superpower. And Solomon also built the temple, the place where God's presence would be made known among his people so that he could bless them. But we also saw last week that there were warning signs, indications that things were amiss with Solomon's heart. We saw him led into idolatry. He abandoned the God of Israel. He turned to other gods and he encouraged others to do the same. And so how did God respond? Well, we're going to read from chapter 11, from verse 9. The Lord was angry with Solomon. God is angry. And he declares judgment against Solomon. He's going to tear the kingdom away from him and give it to someone else, verse 11. And that's justice. That's fair. This is a proper, proportionate, and fair punishment. Solomon corrupted God's kingdom. And so God is going to destroy Solomon's kingdom. That's justice. But you read on, there's also mercy. You see, right after God declares this hard word, he, he tempers it. In verses 11 and 12, I will tear the kingdom from you, but not in your lifetime. 
And not entirely. Your son is going to hang on to one tribe. And then at the end of the chapter, God softens it again in verse 39. I will afflict the house of David because of this, but not forever. Not forever. There's mercy along with the punishment. It is a disaster, but not all is lost. There is is hope, and one day the kingdom is going to be re-established. We're going to see that a bit later. But for now, the kingdom is going to take a big hit. You read from verse 26, you see God, how God goes about doing that. He raises up an opponent, a rival king. Now, we meet a bloke named Jeroboam. Jeroboam was, originally, he was one of Solomon's officials in charge of the forced labor, the head slave driver. And Jeroboam is going to become a bit of an opposition leader. He's Israel's version of Anthony Albanese. Now, I know you think that things can get pretty tense between ScoMo and Albo, but Scott Morrison has never tried to kill his counterpart and drive him out of the country. Solomon is going to do just that. And this all comes after a fateful meeting between Jeroboam and a prophet named Ahijah. And at this meeting, Ahijah has a monumental message for Jeroboam. He gets this robe and he tears it up into 12 pieces and he gives Jeroboam 10 of those and he says, they're yours. 10 tribes of Israel. God is taking them away from Solomon and giving them to you. You, Jeroboam, will be king of Israel. What do you think about that? Now, you might think on the one hand, well, good for Jeroboam. What an honor. But there's something bigger. This is a tragedy. This is, this is awful. This is the people of God being torn in two. Chosen nation. Carved up. This is worse than WA seceding from Australia. This is even worse than Korea being divided since the war. This is a monumental blow to the kingdom of God. And as we read God's word, that's what we're meant to feel as we come across something like this. The devastation, the catastrophe. And that's how we should feel whenever God's people are divided. And sadly, you, you hear about ruptures in churches quite a lot. You get disunity, discontent, disagreement. Now, I praise God that he's given this church a wonderful unity. I, I really think he has. But COVID has generated a situation that has tested that. It's forced us to face questions that we wouldn't otherwise have faced. Questions we don't always agree on. How do we respond to lockdowns? How do we respond to mandates? Is this a sign of worse to come? How do we engage politically on these issues? And it's created a, an environment of fear. And that heightens our anxieties, makes us jumpy and reactive maybe panicked even. And so in this environment, it's harder to be, to be gracious to others. Some fear the virus itself. Some fear how the government is responding. Some fear the vaccines. 
some fear the unvaccinated. And all of these fears, they feed into this tense climate. This is upsetting. And we lament what's happening right now. We lament. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing that we mourn when things aren't right. Because Jesus does. Jesus loves his church. Jesus loves his church. He is his bride. And he grieves when she is in distress. So as we lament much of what's going on, we're sharing Christ's heart. We mourn as he mourns. We mourn with those who mourn, including our Saviour. But as we mourn, we're not helpless. For Israel, the the kingdom split was assured. God said it was going to happen. But as Christians, we're, we're faced with this anxious climate, but there are ways that we can respond that ease that. And we're going to see that as we go. So that's Solomon's failure. That's his part in the kingdom being fractured. But it's not only his fault. Now we're going to meet Solomon's son. And his name is Rehoboam. Now, maybe you're confused right now. We just met Jeroboam. Now we have Rehoboam. Kind of easy to mix them up. I'm going to help you out. But uh, what a name to remember this guy by. Rehoboam the Reckless. And it'll be clear why he deserves that name in just a bit. Heading into chapter 12 now, we see that Solomon's gone and his son is being crowned king. And then right away, the king is faced with challenge. There's a, a delegation and Jeroboam's probably leading this and they're demanding a reduction in the forced labor. That's pretty fair to me. But they're not happy and they want change. Just imagine if you're Rehoboam facing an angry mob on your first day of work. But Rehoboam gives himself three days to think about it. Sounds good. And he gets two sets of advice. The older advisors, they suggest a diplomatic route. In verse 7, be reasonable. Listen to them. Speak kindly to them. And even, they say, serve them. Serve them. All this advice doesn't go down well. Rehoboam rejects their counsel. Serve them. I'm the king. They're my subjects. They serve me. Do you guys not know how this works? And so he turns to the younger advisors. Now, these are his mates. These are the guys he grew up with. And so, of course, he wants to listen to them. Trouble is, their advice sucks. And this is, what, this is what he says. You think my father worked you hard? Well, you haven't seen anything yet. I want to make you toil even harder. And you think my father was rough on you, keeping you in line with whips? I'm going to sick the scorpion onto you, the scorpion. Now, I saw a scorpion the other week. For the first time, I was really excited. And I got a little angry. When a scorpion gets angry, it gets into attack position and it raises its tail with that big stinger. Now, I want you to think about that tail with the stinger like a whip with a nail on it because that's what Rehoboam's talking about. This is a brutal way to keep people in line. He's a tyrant. He doesn't want to serve his people. He wants them to serve him. He wants to use them, to exploit them. He doesn't want to listen to their concerns. He's arrogant. He just wants them to do as they're told. And he will bully and threaten until he gets his way. So he's a cruel king. 
but he's also a bad leader. Like, that's dumb. That's a terrible way for this young whippersnapper, young, he's 41, but young, inexperienced king to try and get the people on side. That's why he's Rehoboam the Reckless. You know, if only he'd listened to his father's advice. Solomon wrote most of the book of Proverbs, and this is what he said about situations like this. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 15, 1. It's good advice, isn't it? You know, you get an angry email or you have someone chewing your head off. What do you want to do? You just want to hit back and double down on the aggression. But how often does that work, really? It tends to escalate things, doesn't it? Like pouring petrol on a fire. But how far does a gentle answer go? When you listen rather than react? When you choose not to get personal or angry or defensive? When you quickly forgive? What a huge difference it makes. Now, Rehoboam should have heeded that advice. And we should too. That's, that's helpful for us as we're faced with disagreements among our church. It's always, that's always important, right? But it's especially important now with the challenges that COVID is presenting us. And I think Rehoboam also demonstrate something that Jesus spoke about. In Matthew 20, Jesus said that the rulers of the nations lord it over them, and their high officials exert authority over them. In this fallen world, that's often the default setting for rulers. Leadership's about exerting your authority, having your way. See, Jesus warns us, and Rehoboam demonstrates, that power is liable to be abused. Now, I was recently watching a documentary on the English monarchy, and over and over again, it's the same story. You see you people that want the crown for their own selfish interests, who abuse their authority, who force their agenda. And I'm watching that, I'm going... And we get a good king here. It's, it's like, it's like this is the norm for, for rulers to behave like this. And Scripture says typically this is how leaders govern. And because Scripture says that, Christians have a long history of advocating for systems of government that bring accountability. The ruler needs to be answerable to another body. Government should, be, should rule by the consent of the governed. Power should be checked. Courts should be independent. Processes should be transparent, and so on. Now, the Bible doesn't demand you must have governments like this, but what it tells us about human nature, it's a good idea and that's why many Christians have been concerned by the pandemic powers bill that's been debated this past week. Because it removes a lot of this accountability. Now, not to say that the government will abuse these powers, because we can't know that. But it's always a risk when you remove some of these checks and balances, and it doesn't matter who's in power. So Rehoboam's tyranny doesn't make him unique, but his foolishness did have massive consequences. And as we read on, we see that this reckless response does not go down well. Ten tribes, they go, no, I'm not putting up with this. We're, we're done with this guy. And then there's, this, there's chaos and Amidst the chaos, Rehoboam's head slave driver 
gets lynched and Rehoboam just manages to escape with his life. And now there's a new king in the north as they crown Rehoboam. It's a little ironic, actually. He was Solomon's head slave driver, and now they protest against slavery and make him their king. Anyway, it's as if WA has split off and put up their premier as a rival PM. And let's remember whose fault this is. Rehoboam made a foolish decision. No doubt about that. But we already knew this was coming back in chapter 11. Solomon turned away from God and God said, there will be consequences. And we see how verse 15 reminds us of that. The Lord brought about this turn of affairs. God used Rehoboam's recklessness to bring about the judgment that he promised on Solomon. So that's two kings who failed. Two kings who brought about the division of God's people. But there's a third king, a good king, a king who succeeds where others failed. And he has established God's kingdom. I want to back up a bit and let's remind ourselves of what the wise counselors said. They said in verse 7 that Rehoboam should be a servant to these people today and serve them. And you know that when Jesus came, he said, that is exactly the kind of king I am. We saw Matthew 20 before and we saw how it describes how, how worldly rulers typically govern. Right after that, Jesus says, I am not like them. The Son of Man, that's Jesus, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus is saying, I am exactly the kind of king the Rehoboam should have been. I am the king who puts the interests of my people first. This is the king we need. Jesus didn't just put his own He didn't just put our needs first, but he put our lives first, ahead of his own life. He gave up his life to save us from our sins. He's our king. And that's what he did for us. His people, his servants, he served us. We're the servants, he's the king. Flipped it around. How extraordinary. Now I've got a question for you. What does a pastor and a member of cabinet have in common? They're both called ministers, aren't they? Have you thought about that? Now the word minister, it just means servant. But think about what that means to, to use that kind of language with leaders. It's, it's a worldview that assumes that leaders should put their people first, religious leaders, secular leaders, whatever. That's an idea that came from Jesus. He taught that. And he also modelled it. Rehoboam would have forced God's people to serve him, but Jesus came to serve. Rehoboam would have multiplied the people's burdens, made it harder for them. Jesus came to lift them. You remember Matthew 11? Come to me. I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Rehoboam and and Solomon were responsible for the separation of God's people. But Jesus is the king who brings us together. 
the king who has established and unified God's kingdom. He died and he rose again to bring each of us into the kingdom of God and not just us but people from all nations on earth saved by Christ, ruled by Christ, blessed by Christ, united by Christ. This is our king. And we need to look to him. We need to look to him, especially in this anxious COVID climate. It's true that for, for many, fears and anxieties are running high. Disagreements are stronger than normal. But when we look to Christ, two things happen. One, we learn from him. And two, we hope in him. Brothers and sisters, let's look to Jesus and learn from Jesus. The more we know him, the more we experience him, the more his heart shapes our hearts. And we know that Jesus doesn't have the heart of a tyrant or a bully. His heart doesn't say, me first. His heart is gentle, humble, gracious, kind, patient. This is just what we need in a COVID atmosphere. This is just what we need to navigate disagreements among our church. And so as we press into Christ's heart, we're changed, aren't we? We realise that we don't have to demand that everyone accepts our opinion. We don't feel the need to judge others who've come to different conclusions than we have. We want to be gentle when engaging and replying with different positions. We want to listen carefully, work hard to understand what others are saying. Now, praise God that this is happening a lot in our church. As a leadership, people have raised their concerns about this or that, and nine times out of ten, it's marked by humility, grace, and respect, and that is so encouraging to see, even when it's disagreeable. Even when there's disagreement, it's encouraging when it's done with grace. And this is the Christ-like attitude that we need to see us through this season. When we do this, we, we imitate Christ and we help maintain the unity of God's people. So look to Jesus and learn from him. And look to Jesus and hope in him. We know that Jesus holds his kingdom in his hands. And we can trust him that he is going to continue to uphold it. We're, we're right to be upset when we see these tensions. But we don't need to despair when Jesus is on the throne. Jesus came to bring his people together. And there will come a day when all disagreement and disunity between us will be gone forever. When Jesus' heavenly throne becomes an earthly throne, there will not be a single believer with a gripe against another. No COVID, no mandates, no contentious situation for the church to navigate. No sin in our hearts to come between us. It'll all be a thing of the past, all be replaced by the love and gentleness of Christ. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, I know that we will be united in the end. I, I know that, I believe that. But what about in the meantime? I'm worried that if the church continues to face these tensions, that maybe they'll be impossible to overcome. I'm worried about the church's mission too. How can we win people for Jesus when we face all these problems? Well, let's think back to Israel. We saw in verse 15, didn't we, that 
as horrible as the split was, as devastating, as sad as it was, and even though it seemed like a loss for God's purposes in the world, God still had a plan for it. It wasn't outside his control. God didn't stop being in charge, even when his people were divided. And so even now we can trust that nothing that is happening right now is outside God's authority. And he will glorify his son through it all. Solomon failed. Rehoboam failed. But Jesus, Jesus has triumphed. And it's, it's wonderful. Not just that he triumphed. It's wonderful how he triumphed. God's ways are brilliant and unexpected. Jesus unified and established God's kingdom, but not through raw might, not through imposing himself, but by being the servant king, putting his own people ahead of his own life. Brothers and sisters, this is our king. We're going to thank him. I'll invite the musos up and we will together thank him and praise him. Father God, we thank you for your son. We thank you for our saviour. Jesus, we thank you that you have served us. You have, have given yourself for us. We are humbled and we are touched by this, so would you please help us to help us to look to you and to share your heart that we might be changed by you, that we might be gracious, that we might be humble, that we might be kind, that we might be these things to each other, among each other, because we are enamored with you. We pray this in your name. Amen.